good evening, everyone. Welcome to the University of Hartford and the Barney School of Business for the third annual symposium on the intersection of risk and finance. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have uh, so many students, alumni, and friends gathered together for one of our signature events. Uh, as you walked along campus and even as you came into the main entrance, uh, you probably noticed um, a lot of signs um, around the campus, on the buildings, uh, emphasizing how much we focus as a university on student success around the themes of providing a challenging and supporting environment for our students. That's critically important for all of the colleges here on campus, including the Barney School of Business. And at the Barney School, we are particularly committed to success in preparing our students for careers in business and in management. And we really try to do that by focusing on three key areas. We want all of our students to be competent in their major and minor areas of study. We also want our students to be confident so they are able to clearly and articulately introduce themselves, meet new people, explain to them who they are, what they're all about, what their areas of competence and expertise are. And we also want to ensure that our students, as part of their experience here at the Barney School, are connected. And this event really embodies all three of those key themes of competence, confidence, and connectivity. And it really embodies those, those three themes because of one of our alumni, Joe Coughlin. Joe, along with a lot of our uh, alumni, uh, it provides a lot of guidance to the Barney School in terms of what are the key skills and characteristics and tool sets that students need to be able to effectively enter into the world of business and succeed once they get there. Joe graduated from the university in 1980 and he has continued to give back in very important ways to his alma mater. He serves on the Board of Regents, he's a strong supporter of athletics, and through this event uh, is uh, equally strong supporter of the Barney School of Business. So this event, focusing on the intersection of risk and finance, uh, is really the mastermind of Joe Coughlin. And even though I've only been at the university for about a year, so I'm told that back in the day when Joe was a student here, uh, the words mastermind and Joe Coughlin might not have often been used in the same sentence. <laughs> but that has certainly changed. Uh, Joe is a mastermind. He is a mastermind at that intersection of risk and finance. He has great competence in understanding the needs of institutions to manage risk and to do it through non-traditional ways. He's a problem solver. He's creative and brings innovative perspectives to the analysis and the solutions that companies need to manage their, uh, to manage their risk effectively. Joe brings that competence. Joe has been very successful in his career in working with some of the leading companies focused on you know, private equity, hedge funds, kind of non-traditional uh, capital types of firms and helping those types of organizations understand, manage their risk. So Joe has a lot of confidence to be able to go into organizations and help them develop creative solutions. And Joe's extremely well connected through his years of experience specializing in this field through the evolution of his company, Corporate Risk Solutions. So we're very fortunate that Joe's confidence, his confidence and his connectivity has led to the development of this symposium and most importantly, Joe's connections enabling us to take advantage of an opportunity for uh, people that Joe works very, very closely with to come here and share with us their experiences and give us more understanding of the different sectors in the insurance industry and what the career opportunities might be for our students. So with that, I want to welcome everybody. It's a, a great symposium uh, in front of us. There'll be a uh, reception for networking, uh, meeting new friends and connecting with old uh, immediately after. So um, pleasure to, uh, to have you here this evening and uh, please sit back and enjoy the symposium. Thank you.
find my tongue? Did you find my tongue? It is? Oh, God. Jeez. Look at what's happened to me. I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm up on top of the world. It should have been somebody else. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. Flying away on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? Believe it or not, it's just me. Enjoying the show? Thank you. You know? Just like the light of a new day, it hit me from out of the blue, waking me out of the spell I was in, making all of my wishes come true. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. Look at me falling for you. What? What's going? On? Is this like a like a flash mob? What the? You guys, Tim, did you do this, Rob? Are you? Hartford cheerleaders. So, I, if anyone's heard me talk at some of these other uh, events at the university before, and some of the things at Talent Night, we've had things where we talk about embrace your fear, um, and uh, I wanted to embrace my fear, although uh, I think I need to scare myself even more because <laughs> and now I want to do more into the future. But uh, I would like to first um, welcome you. I hope you, uh, last year you probably saw some very dazzling graphics that we put together. This year is just gonna take it to a whole new level. Um, as for a, uh, I'm not a very technologically advanced person as my people that are with me that will tell you. But first of all, I wanna thank a few different people. I wanna thank Malik from the insurance department uh, who we first discussed this thing uh, three years ago. This is the third annual CRS symposium intersection of risk and finance. And uh, we sat down and talked, and we, James Fairfield Son, who was the dean at the time, uh, then talking it over with uh, Christina uh, on the development office, we felt as though there just had to be a better way to position the University of Hartford as the proverbial insurance capital of the world uh, in the insurance business, and, and to take some of the, uh, the uh, accolades that rightfully so go to other places or at least historically have, gone to St. John's, down in the city, and gone into Georgia, and gone to Florida, and uh, down at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. So uh, I'm very proud of my uh, background at the University of Hartford. I'm very proud of you, uh, especially the undergrads and the grad students that are uh, the joint finance uh, and insurance majors. And what the whole idea of this concept was, 
was to show that insurance is not just insurance and finance is not just finance. And there really truly is an intersection. And what I learned years ago was that um, my whole life has been uh, a whole uh, host of analogies and metaphors. And so what I try to do is try to link things. And when I see commonalities and I see spectrums and I, I see elliptical orbits, which we'll get into, I try to connect them, and I try to give the relevancy to the people around me because I think it makes everybody that much stronger. I'd also like to thank my father, um, is uh, here tonight, who was started in the insurance business, um, I don't even know how many, 70, 80 years ago. He's just turned, he's 90 and a half, uh, but he's still here, still working every day. Uh, uh, Jack. And I'd also like to thank a few different people, just really quickly, and then we'll move on. Uh, Kim Patlas, Carolyn Burns, my partners, Alexa, who has uh, just been with us for about six months, and she's done a fantastic job at CRS. And I'd like to thank my two speakers uh, in particular. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for really getting Rob here. But um, uh, Rob uh, Schimmick, AIG, you'll hear from in a, in a little while. And then uh, Tim Fazio from Atlas Holdings. So that as the backdrop, this is the, the intersection of risk. So just a, a very short a bit about us, but it gives you the context so that you could get the understanding of the way that CRS works and then that the way that the intersection of the insurance companies and risk management and enterprise risk management all falls in line. So if we say, you know, who is CRS? Uh, we would say that we're an independent risk advisory firm serving the alternative capital space. When we say, gotta watch that. When we say the alternative capital space, we're talking about third party asset managers that have gone out and raised capital from normally endowments, from wealthy uh, individuals, from pension plans, uh, and the like. And you know, those people are looking for higher rates of return than going into just the, uh, an index fund or going into so, uh, a normal money manager or going into a bank or a, just their, you know, more of a vanilla 401k plan. These people are looking for superior returns, which, of course, if you're looking for superior returns, you're going to have much higher risk factors that are associated with it. So that brings us into our world, which is about 90% about of our world is uh, private equity. So these are sponsors that go out. You'll meet one in a little while, uh, who is Tim Fazio. They go out and raise these, these dollars, and then they become the asset managers. They go out and put those dollars to work. They buy companies. They improve the performance of the companies. They turn them into a place where they can hopefully have a successful exit strategy, which will take place and they could be an IPO, initial public offering, or it could be a strategic sale to a larger buyer, or it could be uh, just an acquisition model that will just keep growing for uh, you know, a period of time until there's a, a better time. So um, that's, that's, what, that's what our sector is, and that's what we deal with. So uh, this is who we think we are, though, really. And I put that up there seriously because uh, there's two people in this room uh, who are with us this summer, um, Bill and Rob, and they would say that if they were at our counter at, in our office, Rob didn't get to see our new offices, did he? Well, maybe he did before he left. But um, we have Batman at the front uh, of the, uh, on the credenza uh, in the reception area when you walk in. And he's there for a reason because Batman is was, where there is injustice, I will be there. And... In our world, we are very, very passionate about the, the place that we act as a fiduciary on behalf of our clients. We've got the private equity firms and the sponsors on this side, and then we've got the portfolio companies, which are the companies that they buy and that they hold for a period of time, that we are active fiduciaries looking at all of their risks and their areas. So uh, if I take that a different step, I'd like to take this into make this plural. This is from uh, The Dark Knight. And I like to say, it's not who we are underneath, but what we do that defines us. And, and think about that for a second, because the people that you're going to hear from tonight, um, and, and my partners will tell you, and anybody that knows me, I really personally only hang out with people or talk to people that I think have impeccable character. And I think that most people that you'll find that are that are fairly successful or that it doesn't matter, it's not financial success, it's just in life. If you're dealing with people that have very high character, you're not gonna find yourself into you know, you know, very squirrely areas very much. So what, what I'd like to impart, just my first little part of my little sermon as to um, 
the a presenter here tonight is the Gallup study does a poll. Every, this is for the undergrads and, and the grad students um, who may still be uh, deciding what they're going to do in, in their careers. But Gallup does a poll every year, and it found that in uh, any organization, any size, from the smallest companies to the largest companies, so from 50 you know, all the way up to thousands and tens of thousands, 54% of the employees that are working in a company are, act, are disengaged on a day-to-day -day basis in their job. So they really don't know the, the latitude that they have to work with. They're not quite sure you know, the boundaries of their job. They're not quite sure what kind of uh, a role they're empowered with, where their decisions begin in, their, in, in the end. 29%, uh, again, this is across the board, 29% of the employees are actively engaged. They are absolutely out there, and they are trying to do their best every single day. They're very collaborative. Uh, people and that you want to work with them. That leaves 17%, and that leaves 17% of a workforce, every workforce, that is actively disengaged, that is speaking badly about the company, is not happy, is looking to uh, incite other unhappiness in the organization. So when you think about that, it's, it's who we are that define us. I can even take that number and, and say 54% is, is being very, very kind. Uh, people that are coming out of school today, and I'm not picking on, you know, I'm, uh, I graduated in 1980, and we had troubles then, and there was employment problems, and there were a whole bunch of things. But uh, there's, uh, I read two books the other day coming back on a plane, and they're both pretty crappy, but they both had the same theme. And um, they were, that the number is not 54%, it's about 70% of all young people come into a company, or into a new corporation, and they kind of expect to be entertained. They want to be say, hey, this is not what I signed up for, or make me happy. It's kind of, as you'll probably hear from our speakers that are coming up after, if you want a, just, a, a, just a small dose of reality is that it, it can't work that way. <laughs> or it can't work that way for very long. And um, either the one, the company that's trying to make you happy is going to probably not do too well and won't be around too long, or um, uh, they're just going to fail in making you happy. So you've got to bring your own happiness, you've got to bring your own direction, you've got to bring your own motivation to the place where you're, where you're ultimately going to try to get. So a little bit about who are our clients um, at CRS. This is just a, a little bit of a, a, a background. So these would be a sampling of some of the different folks that are out here. So here's you have like Tim Fazio's company, Atlas Holdings. That's up here. It's about a $900 million uh, fund. Uh, I'll let Tim describe everything about uh, Atlas a little while, but you have very large hedge funds that might be here, Centerbridge, Distressed Debt Funds, Wilbur Ross, et cetera, Macquarie, um, IFM, Brian Clark is making his way here. He's a regent, also lives in West Hartford, and he'll be here a little bit later. He's over at IFM, which is Bridges, Tunnels, Roads, um, uh, airports, and, uh, and the like. Uh, uh, Warburg Pincus uh, is, is a, a fantastic client, and uh, we do a, an enormous amount in the energy uh, space, et cetera. Now, who do those people own? Who do these, um, these sponsors, oops, sorry, there's my little thing. These sponsors would then invest in portfolio companies, which go across a whole host. And then we could say that there's probably, you could say there's five, you could say there's six, you could say there's 14 different industry classes that those sponsors would invest in. So some might do, do just energy. Some may do... Um, consumer products, some are going to just do uh, real estate, some will just do infrastructure, some will do a blend, a hybrid fund of all different types of things. So whatever it is, those are types of uh, specific types of things that are there. So those companies then turn into, these would be a sampling of some either current or past clients that we've worked with. And as I said before, I, I was looking at this slide a little earlier and uh, with Beverly, and I, I was saying, I, I like to make I like to connect dots and things like that. And I also have a very sick sense of humor. So I was kind of saying like, OK, so we could start off one day all right, at the beginning here. And we go to Little Caesars over here. I don't know if you can see this very well. So we go to Little Caesars. And then after that, we could decide, hey, let's go over to Papa Gino's. And then after, we could call even over to Yelp and find out what's another good couple of restaurants to go to. And then we could go home and get a fleet enema and uh, call it a night. Um, another way is here's uh, 
trek, starting out with bicycles, right? Well, bicycles have rubber tires, so we start off with the beginning of uh, you know, uh, transportation on the bicycle side, and then that goes up, the, uh, the, it turns into the cars with General Motors, and then cars turns into you know, the Chryslers and the GMs, and then they went into buses, and then people started renting cars, and now we have Tesla. So you see like an, a, uh, a continuum that will take place, and then baby joggers are the car seats that would go in the, in the, in the cars themselves. Up here, you would have Rydell football helmets, uh, so you can imagine the product liability with concussions and head trauma uh, injuries that are out there. And then Remington firearms and, and, and the like. So those would be some of the, uh, uh, a sampling of the kind of firms, I uh, don't have, do I have any Atlas firms up there? No, I don't, exactly. But Tim will tell you something about those. Um, and and they, they uh, would be a sampling, would be some very big exposures that would be on there. Um, so, who else do we work with? Well, we're an advisor, right? So we work with every broker that's, we'll work with any broker in the world. Um, there tend to be certain brokers that, very, that shine very brightly in, uh, in certain areas. Some are fantastic at energy. Uh, some people, some are fast, uh, fantastic generalists at the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, but these would be some of the, the bigger brokers, the, the Aons, the Marshes, the Locktons, Brown and Browns, Willises, and things like that. Um, and then in turn, we would also work with uh, these, well, any insurance company. We work with about 50 on, an a on average across the globe on any given day. And they're spread out amongst all those different types of product lines that we discussed before. Uh, it might be uh, property. It could be general liability workers' compensation, it could be crime coverage, DNO, general partnership liability, all of these things. And again, ours is to be able to say that on a day-to-day -day basis, we are touching all of these companies, all of those portfolio companies, all of those brokers, with all of these wholesalers, which are specialty underwriters that might be out there for some specific risks. So across the globe, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're seeing how the market expands and contracts. And I, I always say it's kind of like a kaleidoscope. When you look at a kaleidoscope and you turn it, worlds expand and contract. So we see what happens when the aviation market dries up, when the avi aviation market expands, when the DNO market contracts, and then it expands. And then when energy becomes the hot button, and then real estate becomes the hot button. Property is very soft right now. So we see these things, but our clients normally are going out to the market once a year. So they really don't have the same type of background, and they can't. And a risk manager can't. Uh, they can't see it. So my first or my second uh, thought to the people that are the finance majors that are going to start out, and maybe they'll go into a, a assistant controller, then become a controller, then become possibly a treasurer or a, uh, uh, a CFO one day, and then CFO turns into a CEO was to sensitize you all so that if you become uh, involved in insurance, do not treat it lightly. I've said this for the last, uh, this is the third year I'll be saying it. it. It can't be treated as a commodity. It has to be treated with the respect that it, it, it deserves because it can change a corporation's entire outlook. It can support the balance sheet. It can have a company survive and, and, uh, and thrive by doing the right type of risk management. And it's, I think you'll hear from Rob in particular um, how this all does come together. And um, it's, uh, it's a very, very healthy relationship if it's done correctly. So uh, this is, when we put all those pieces together, this is what it looks like mathematically. No, it doesn't, not really, OK? But this, I think, is the longest math equation in the world. That's what they, when I Googled it, right? So that's that. But no, but this is what it really looks like. It looks like this, right? Still, it's a, it's a, it's a paper-intensive industry, but, but the good part about it is it's now, everything's online. We have data rooms that are online. In the old days, we used to, you know, 30 years ago, I'd have to fly out on a plane to go out to Oklahoma, spend five days in a windowless office uh, to go through thousands and thousands of files in order to build a loss chart to be able to go to an underwriter like Rob and to be able to say, hey, workers' compensation losses are $15.5 million a year. How do you know? Well, we just spent 
all this time just amalgamating this information and to be able to come up with a, a price sensitive option for them. So uh, this is, I'll break it down very simply again. This would be in this case right here, this is Tim Fazio who you'll meet a little bit later. He's a sponsor. He goes out and he buys portfolio companies. Those portfolio companies are, you know, uh, we always find that the average fund, uh, and Tim, you can correct me, but I would say there's between nine and 15 assets per fund. And then when they expand about 75% of their capital, they go out and they raise another fund. But these, they can have these hold periods of these companies for, you know, five, seven, 10 years that they might hold these. So these are individual portfolio companies. These are investments that they make. These Portfolio companies, in turn, have relationships with brokers, and then, in turn, brokers reach out to the insurance companies. One of the things that CRS does is we absolutely, we're not a broker. We don't want to be a broker. We respect the brokers. They play an enormously important role in this, um, in this, uh, uh, this function. But uh, we are huge, huge believers in transparency, and we believe that the insurance companies if, if treated fairly and are given the proper information and are not just told limited information as to what they need to do, uh, that it, you tend to have a much more healthy relationship. And that's very much why people come to us, because they like the way we work and it's collaborative. But that sounds like it's too much about us. All right, so we wrap that all up into the CRS thing, and then we turn it on its head. I told you these were going to be great. But now, I just wanted to say, the way that I, 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 I passionately say this last part, um, because I, I truly mean this. Um, and I, when I first uh, you know, got Kim and Carolyn to join me and, and anybody who does come in, I try to say the way that we look at our universe is in a way that it's, it's, we see whole universes. We see elliptical orbits. We see galaxies within galaxies. We see the intersection of different sponsors coming in, different insurance companies coming in. We see the portfolio companies in each fund spinning around in these different orbits and then intersecting with other orbits. So I thought that this is really probably one of the best ways uh, to look at it. Um, one, there's an intersection of, we use the dark night, so we've got day and night. We've got the Batman, if he's the hero, well then there has to be a villain, right? And then we say, this is risk and finance, those two intersect, all right? Spin that around, that's what you get there. So, but this is the way I really see it. This is, whoop, I, I didn't, I cut them right off. Hang on, we gotta, this is the way we see the universe. And I don't know, hit it one more time. Will it go? So this is from the movie Prometheus. This is me. Here's Rob Schimmick up here, and here's, here's Tim Fazio. He's up there somewhere. And, and then it's nothing, right? So uh, I was going to say, speaking of nothing, but that wouldn't be true. Uh, I now want to start to move on to the second part of the, maybe this next uh, slide. We'll go. Do you know why it's not? Uh... Sorry. This is, it, it worked in practice. So anyway, what I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to introduce um, uh, Rob Schimmick uh, from, from AIG. Rob um, has just been named, uh, oh, it, this, is, this will be totally deflating after I just done that. So we'll just intersect here, AIG, with um, Tim Fazio at, at Atlas. But um, Rob, uh, Brian Clark is still not here, but uh, we had the chance to meet uh, Rob just over a year ago and had an opportunity to uh, come together on a very, very ugly, um, really, really ugly claim that took place on a South American asset. Very big um, uh, claim, and I, I'll, uh, I'll give you more details later if somebody wants them, <laughs> but we're trying to uh, 
put this all behind us, but uh, he was able to step in and help uh, where no one else was able to do and uh, where many people had failed before. Uh, we personally took it as a, uh, a sign of uh, a great friendship and a great uh, amount of um, uh, uh, business partnership between us. And, uh, and, and then in dealing with Rob over time, um, like I say, he's just been named the CEO of the Americas for all of AIG. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. Um, I think there's two things that I envy most about Rob in particular, though, right now. I think, one, he benches about 475 pounds, and I can't do that. Um, and number two, I like the way he rolled up here today. He had a helicopter, and he gets to take a helicopter back. Uh, I don't know where he's going to tomorrow, but he probably logs like 300,000 miles a year. So the mere fact that we even get him here is a, is a fantastic thing for the university and for ourselves. You're going to get a chance to tap into both of uh, these uh, guys' brains afterwards. We're going to have a little uh, panel discussion, then we're going to invite questions from the audience. But um, I'd like to introduce you to a guy who's also um, on the board of his, uh, his alma mater, and he is very involved. And um, I, I really can't say anything more, because otherwise I'm going to steal your thunder about what you've done in the last several years. So ladies and gentlemen, Rob Schimmick. I have no idea how to follow that. I don't have any singing for you, um, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best anyway to follow the, uh, the great Joe. Um, let, me, uh, let me say, first of all, it's a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to be here. I want to try to do four things with you. I'll make that reasonably brief, but I'm going to be here with you also this evening through the cocktail reception, and I want you to feel free um, to, uh, to catch up with me then. The four things I thought I would do with you is, first, I want to just spend a moment and introduce you to AIG. So I'll talk to you about the, the largest insurance company on the face of the planet Earth. That's how I would introduce AIG. The, the second thing is, given the title of today's event, um, the intersection of risk and finance, um, I think it's really important for us to have the opportunity to give you a real life um, example or two of how these two things really intersect. And I, and I thought I would share with you a really simple case study of life that helps you understand how the, the intersection really happens in the real world. The third thing I thought I would do is help you to better understand how big companies, maybe how a company like AIG, tries to separate itself from the rest of the pack in an industry that's filled with a lot of alternatives. So there's other insurance companies out there, and I want to give you a sense of what it is that we do. And then fourth, um, I'm big on uh, trying to share life lessons and share some leadership points, and I couldn't resist the opportunity having the stage of sharing, uh, of sharing a couple of observations with you. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm going to begin first by, by keeping things in perspective. And I want you to understand, you know, I'm speaking to you as the president of the Americas uh, of the largest insurance company in the world. And I recognize that my perspective might be different than a smaller insurance company, or the perspective of one of my competitors, or the perspective of um, Joe, or the perspective of a client. And so, so I, wanted, I, I kind of always try to help people to understand, let's start with understand where the speaker is coming from. So this is a way for you to understand the differences and the importance of differences in perspective. This is, oops. Our local news stations go nuts. This is from the last two days. There's nothing fake about this. This is all real. Southern California is getting a bitter blast of cold weather this morning. It is cold it outside. It is cold. It's a little windy out there yeah. as well. Leaves certainly blowing all around. Trees swaying. See, it feels do have some sort of a breeze here. You can see my hair's blowing around. And we got the leaves blowing around behind me, and so that can cause some problems for you this morning. A little bit of a wind showing up here, and the trees gives you a sense of it. How are you feeling right now? Cold. Cold isn't only affecting people, it's affecting crops. These are some of the oranges we found on the ground. Those clouds? Those are clouds. I hope so. Yeah, indeed. I hope so. A little bit of cloud cover out there. Right now, it is 42 degrees here in Lancaster. Earlier today, it might have snowed if the temperatures would have dropped just a little bit more. Customers at Starbucks were choosing.
using the drive-thru as warm beverage after warm beverage was handed out. Are you ready for probably two of the coldest nights you've ever experienced in Southern California? And look at the temperatures only into the 50s. Cold, 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 coming our way. Beyond yeah, cold. Break. We have team coverage on this freezing cold weather. It's about 48 degrees right now. The skies are clear. It is cold. I'm absolutely freezing. How long is this gonna last? It's so cold out there. The extra blanket, the heater, the dog, anything you can do to keep warm, snuggle. Oh my, stop it, I can't watch it anymore. <laughs> So, so I know we experienced the polar vortex last year, and, uh, and in particular up here in Hartford, I think maybe your definition of cold would be a little bit different than the definition in Southern California. With that, it's still cold in everyone's eyes, right? And so, um, so I share that with you to just remind you, you're gonna hear about my perspective today, and I recognize there's lots of other perspectives out there. Um, a moment for you about AIG, first of all, um, I mentioned earlier that we happen to be the world's largest insurance company. So um, the, the way you think about that is we have $108, $108 billion worth of um, gap shareholders' equity. So in plain English, our assets are greater than our liabilities by $108 billion. So we have enough assets to cover all of our liabilities. And if we're wrong, because the liabilities are more than we thought, we can only cover the first $108 billion of those liabilities before we need to go get help from someone else. And by the way, for those of you who know, who know any of the history of AIG, I hope we never again need help from anyone else. Um, the, um, the, the company has 63,000 people. We operate in 200 countries around the world. I recently had the opportunity of running our operations in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, so my deep British accent um, comes from my time in London, um, but now I sit in New York and I run all of the countries um, in the Americas, everything from Canada down to Argentina. Um, this company is the um, powerhouse when it comes to uh, underwriting large, complex risks that a lot of other people wouldn't want to touch or wouldn't know how to get their head around, and, and that's sort of the who we are. And I share that with you just to give you a matter of perspective. So everything I'm going to share with you from here on, you understand, talking about a big global company, lots of people um, with uh, roots that go back 95 years. This picture here uh, is a picture of the most winning sports team in the history of professional sports. This is the New Zealand All Blacks. Is anyone here in the room at all familiar with rugby? Okay, a couple people are familiar with rugby. I hope you're familiar with the All Blacks. If you are not, um, they have won um, over time since the beginning of professional rugby about 85% of all of the matches that they've ever played. So imagine that. You play 100 matches, you win 85 of those 100. Um, I put the slide up there for one really interesting uh, reason. Joe said, not sure where you're going next. Tomorrow morning I will be on a flight to Chicago and on Saturday the largest ever rugby match in the history of the United States of America will be held at Soldier Field. And so we have uh, Soldier Field where the Chicago Bears play and that will be filled with uh, 61,500 screaming lunatic uh, rugby fans and uh, the All Blacks will be wearing the, uh, the AIG uh, jersey. They'll play against the US team and if you didn't know this, um, here's a really interesting trivia question for you. Um, the last time that the rugby was ever played in the Olympics, the Summer Olympics, was back in the 1920s. And the defending champions from the rugby championship in the 1920s is the United States of America. The next time that you will see rugby played in the Olympics is in Brazil, coming up in the next Summer Olympics. So, um, on Saturday on NBC, get yourself a cold beer if you're 21, and, um, and uh, sit down and watch, uh, watch some rugby. So that's a little bit of perspective of who we are and where we're coming from. Um, now let me give you a little bit of risk and finance put together. By the way, I'm a reformed bean counter, um, so uh, I began my career as a partner with Deloitte and & Touche, and so I am a finance guy by heart. I now just happen to be um, running uh, a piece of an insurance company. Um, this is um, yield curves for the United States of America. If you went to Bloomberg yourself, 
you could actually get this picture of these yield curves yourself, so there's nothing magical about them. This is what interest rates look like in the United States of America. And here's what I wanted to show you is, look back in 1990. You see how high interest rates were back in 1990? For if you put your money in the bank for three months, if you bought a three-month CD back in 1990, you would earn just about 7%, 6.5% interest rate on money that you put in the bank for, um, for three months. Does anybody think you could earn that today? Not even close, right? So, and you can see that the yield curve was reasonably flat, and if you put your money out in, in the bank for 30 years, you could earn a little bit over 8%. That's what the interest rates looked like in 1990. This is what they look like in 2000, 10 years later. Um, still reasonably high, 6% for the three month, uh, and again, very close to 6% all the way out in 30 years. And the next line is what they looked like a decade later in 2010, and look how low interest rates were for the three month. So if you put your money in the bank for three months, what did you get back? Kind of nothing, but at least you got your money back. And that's what you got back in 2000. And uh, for 30 year, if you put your money in the bank for 30 years, you could earn something like 4%, way down from the number of 8% that you were earning back in 1990, right? So you're gonna get the sense of how finance, how the macroeconomic interest rate environment affects the insurance industry and affects the way we take risk at the largest insurance company on the face of the planet. This is what the rates looked like in December of 2012, which was the low point of the global financial crisis. You could earn almost nothing everywhere on the yield curve. It took, you had to go all the way out for 30 years before you earned as much as 3%. And then this yellow line is what they look like um, right now. And so you can see darn close to the lowest point that they've been in the history of um, modern um, finance, um, actually since the, uh, since the Great Depression. So, who cares? Um, we care as an insurance company. The way we make money, the way we accept risk, so we are happy to take the risk off of Tim's balance sheet and bring it onto our balance sheet. We'll protect against that risk. We make money fundamentally two ways, and only two ways. Those two ways are, the first thing is, we try to underwrite really well. So if we take the risk off of Tim's balance sheet, we would like to charge him more, or at least as much, as it will ultimately cost us, so that we cover our cost of goods sold. Not a very complicated uh, compl uh, statement, very similar to what you would find at Walmart. You go to Walmart, rest assured, the things they're selling on their shelves, they're trying to sell at least for their cost of goods sold. I hope that makes sense. That's the first way we make money. The second way that we make money is when he pays us his premiums, we get to hold them, we stick them in the bank, and we earn investment income on them. Back in 1990, I earned a lot of investment income on what he gave me, but today I earn very little. You see that in the picture, right? As a matter of fact, I'm earning about 7% less, 7% less yield today, profit today, by taking his premiums in the door than I would have earned back in 1990. So, back in 1990, if I got my underwriting wrong, I had, a, I had a cushion. And my cushion was, I could still make money through the investment income, and the investment income was still pretty darn high. Today, if I don't get my underwriting correct, I've got almost no cushion, because the interest I'm gonna earn on those premiums he's given to me is somewhere darn near zero. Does that make sense? So, that's what happens with a property insurance policy. So if Tim wants to buy insurance to cover his building, usually I'll be have about one year from the day I collect his premium until on average when I pay his claim and I get to hold the cash for that period of time. But not every policy has the same length of time. The next example, is something called a, uh, a claims made casualty policy. So a claims made casualty policy is for when someone slips and falls, as opposed to when the building burns down. And the life of that policy, on average, in the experience of AIG, tends to be about four years. So from the day I collect Tim's premiums until the day I ultimately pay the claim, it can be, on average, four years. So I get to 
I've, I can make money by getting the underwriting right, and I get to hold his money for four years and keep the investment income. Back in 1990, I made a lot of investment income. Today, I earn a little bit of investment income, and the difference between the two is 600 basis points. I earn 6% less today for every dollar that I collect and hold for the next four years than I would have earned back in 1990. So again, the importance of making my, my underwriting correct is much greater today than it was back in 1990. The intersection of how I take risk to the macroeconomic finance environment that we encounter today. Workers' compensation. Every company in the United States of America has to have workers' compensation in case their employee gets hurt on the job. It's part of the law. We write that type of insurance, and on average, from the day we collect the premiums until the day we pay out, it's six years because a worker can get hurt, and then we may have to continue to pay that worker for their injury year after year after year for up to, on average, six years. Again, back in 1990, if I got my underwriting wrong, I had a big margin for error because I could earn still 7.5% on the investment income for every day that I held that premium that I collected before I make my payments out to cover the claim. I hope that makes sense to you. And by the way, there's policies that we write that are written on what we call an occurrence basis, which says um, if we learn later, I hope this is an okay example for, for people, but if we learn later that McDonald's makes people's health not so great, and later there's a lawsuit that says we should have known it and McDonald's has to pay, if we wrote the insurance company when the event occurred, back when the person was harmed. That's what we call an occurrence-based policy, and on average, it's six years from the day we collect the premium. So I'm trying to give you two main points. Number one, the interest rate environment and the risk-protecting uh, uh, environment intersect here on this picture, and depending on the level of interest rates, it has a big impact on the level of profitability and the level of risk taking that we as an insurer are willing to take. And not every insurance product was created equal because a property product is different than a casualty product is different than a workers' comp product is different than a, uh, a what we call an occurrence-based uh, casualty policy. So I hope that makes sense to you. And then the granddaddy of them all is something called excess workers' compensation. So if I wrote that policy back for, for Tim back in 1990, for the next 16 years, I would have collected 7% investment income on the premiums he paid me, I'd be pretty happy. Today, for the next 16 years, I earn a very low interest rate, and therefore, I'm very hesitant to write that policy for him, much more hesitant to write it today than I would have been to do it a couple decades ago. That's the intersection of risk and finance. Um, this is not just a US phenomenon. This is a picture of interest rates, nothing complicated to it, um, a picture of interest rates for other countries around the world. Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom, and Canada, and the picture is fundamentally the same. They were much higher back in 1990 than they are today at the five-year point on the yield curve. So back in those days, if I was on average going to hold the premiums for five years, I would have earned a lot of money. And today, I'll earn very little money. So therefore, to insurance companies, it's really important that we are disciplined and that we only take risks where we truly believe we, under, we understand the underwriting that, we're, that we have to undertake in order to protect against that risk. So this is a picture of the globe. And I wanted to make one last uh, finance point for you, and then I'm going to move on. My last finance point for you and the way that these two things intersect is I mentioned to you that we're a very global company. So we operate in 200 different company, countries around the world. And even in one country versus the other, the answer can be extremely different. So I want to just help you with understanding something. We measure ourselves, we un measure our underwriting results using a very common formula, and the formula is not complicated. The denominator in the formula is how much did we collect in premium, and the numerator in the formula is how much do we pay out in losses and expenses. We call that something called the combined ratio. It's the combination of how much we pay in losses and expenses compared to how much premiums. And can you understand 
that if I pay out exactly, if I collect $100 of premiums and I pay out $70 in losses and $30 in expenses, I'm left with $0 of profit. That's also known as a combined ratio of 100. It's one, exactly one. The numerator and the denominator are exactly equal. What I want you to see is depending on where you are in the world, the underwriting answer that we're looking for is very different. So for example, in the United States of America, if I underwrite today to where my losses and my expenses are exactly equal to the premiums that I collect, I can earn a return on equity of 7% because I do get to keep investment income over, over a period of time. And so I can earn a return on investment of 7%. I can, I can in uh, Argentina, for every $100 of premiums I collect, I can actually pay out $127 of claims and expenses and still earn a return on equity of 7%. And in Greece, I can earn, um, if I collect $100 of premiums, I can only afford to pay $83 in the form of losses and expenses. And in Japan, if I collect $100 of premiums, I can pay out $89 of losses and premiums, uh, losses and expenses. Why is that? It's the difference between a highly inflationary country, a deflationary country, a low inflation country, and then the average country of the United States. Everywhere in the world, the finance drives our motivation to protect against the risk and to take the risk and the story is extremely different. So when people ask us a question, we don't try to be evasive, but in the spirit of you know, kind of answering those questions, you have to tell people there's not a one-size-fits-all answer to the simple question that you've just asked, and I hope that makes sense for you. Okay, so that's the environment. I'll quickly just say to you, so what do we do to protect against that? From an AIG perspective, um, look, it's very hard for us to make a lot of money um, because the interest rates are low, and we've got to underwrite really well, but there's a lot of other competitors out there and someone might offer a lower price. So we try to distinguish ourselves and there's two fundamental ways we try to distinguish ourselves and I want to bleed another concept in here and that is we use something that we refer to as science. This is a football player. Um, it's actually a guy by the name of Chuck Bidnarik. He played for the Philadelphia Eagles. Is there anybody in the room who's a Philadelphia Eagle fan? Yeah, guys. Um, we're going to the Super Bowl this year. Um, <laughs> just kidding. No, I'm not. Um, anyway, this is Chuck Bidnarik. He played on the world champion 1960 Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and look at his equipment. There's no face mask. There's not much padding here. There's no padding here at all. There's no, no real protection probably in that thing of protecting his noggin. And uh, this is what uh, LaShawn McCoy looks like today, who is today's running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. It's the same human being a world-class athlete inside of the uniform, but the uniform is a whole lot different. That's a concussion-protecting helmet. That's a face mask. He's got shin guards. He's got, um, he, he's got uh, uh, guards over, his, uh, over every muscle in his body. He's got gloves on his hands. Um, it just shows to you that the equipment is a little bit different, and that's the way we think about science. We, make, we have underwriters, we have thousands of underwriters around the world making underwriting decisions every day. Back in the day, the equipment we gave them was kind of like what you see with Chuck Bednarik. They had basic equipment, some basic knowledge, and they had lots of experience and lots of capability. Today, they've got the same kind of experience and the same kind of capability, but we're trying to give them superpowers. We're trying to give them things that will protect them from all evil, sort of like the Batman example that you heard earlier today. But that's the way we think about science. Let me give you a real quick example. If you haven't heard this, and I'll get this statistic wrong, but the exact statistic doesn't matter. Did you know that there is as much data created in the world in two days as was created, so yesterday and today, as much data has been created in the world yesterday and today as was created from the beginning of time through 2002. Did you know that? So what you need to provide to your people is a little bit different than it used to be back in the day. 
they got to be able to have information faster. They've got to be able to process information better. In this world of big data, there's a lot of information available to us that can make us a better, smarter, more effective underwriter, and quite frankly, help us be a better partner with our insureds by helping them to better understand the data. Great examples for AIG on the data. One of the things we do is we pay $100 million of claims every day. $100 million of claims paid out the door every day. You do that day after day after day after day, year after year after year, you've got a ton of data. Our biggest problem is it's only in a system that was built in the last handful of years that makes it easy to get to. Does that make sense to you, right? We've been in business for 95 years, but a lot of our data in the earlier years was on paper. Remember the picture that Joe showed? He wasn't kidding you. That picture with the stack of paper and, the, uh, and sort of the, the frustrated look of someone who's got to actually deal with all the complexity and all that paper, that's real life. And that's what claim files look like if you wanted to stack up the claim files for everything we've ever done over time. The technology that's available today, folks, is unbelievable. IBM has a technology known as Watson. For anyone who's heard about it, if you haven't had a chance, Google it and read about it. But this technology has the ability to read a claim file and to learn from the claim file and give us insights that we can then turn back around and share, for example, with Tim. And we can say, hey, Tim, did you know that unlike most of your competitors, we find that the most common injury you experience in your company is a shoulder strain, a back strain, and that's disproportionately high for your company than it is for others. And oh, by the way, the likelihood that that's going to cause you a lawsuit is higher than others. And oh, by the way, when you get sued, it actually costs you 10% more to solve that lawsuit than it does for most of your competitors. We only know that because of our ability to mine data that was not put in place in a structured environment. And I'd like to share that with you in the context of how we try to differentiate ourselves. The last point I'd like to share with you about how we differentiate ourselves is um, figuring out new ways to take risk, take risk off people's balance sheets. Did you know that in the United States, the US rail system um, today carries about 4,000% more, 4,000% more um, crude oil um, or, or liquefied natural gas or, or petroleum products 4,000 times more than it did just a decade earlier. So imagine that. The amount of risk traveling on this aging railroad infrastructure coming through towns like Hartford, Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, that could blow up the entire town, the entire city, if you had a risk where it was full, where the train was full of um, flammable if stuff like oil, gas, et cetera. And, um, and so an example of an innovation, just two weeks ago, AIG put out an insurance policy that offers $1 billion of insurance coverage for a catastrophe that strikes a rail above and beyond whatever coverage they could already buy in the market. Why? Because data shows that currently the risk is different than it used to be just a decade ago. Our job is to pay attention to trends that are happening in the marketplace, innovate, and come back with solutions that will help to solve that. So um, three things I've told you so far. Who is AIG? How do I think about the intersection of finance and risk? Uh, and then what do we do to sort of differentiate ourselves? Let me end and turn the uh, floor over to Tim by just giving you a, uh, a couple of quick thoughts here about just leadership in general and a couple points that I would want to make if, if I were sitting in front of my kids or anyone who I really wanted to grow up to do things the right way. And I would say to you this, um, first of all, this is my tailgating bus. Um, this is Philadelphia Eagles tailgating bus. And frighteningly, that's me. Um, and uh, you know, my one point that I'd make is, so um, I want to talk to you and understand this is my perspective. So already you may think I'm delusional. And you might say, I don't even care what his perspective is. I'm not going to listen. I understand. But I know at least three people in the audience are going to listen to me, right? Um, so these are my five lessons in life. And by the way, I think they should apply to all of you. Um, but it's just, just my thoughts. 
Um, my first piece of advice to you is be good to all the people all the time. My first dealings with Joe were not fun, right? With that said, we were good to one another, and we worked together to solve one of the more complicated problems that you will encounter. And the truth of the matter is I think we'll have a great long-term relationship because of just treating people with mutual respect and being a problem solver, not being a jerk. It's not necessary. Um, second thing is, there's no substitute for hard work. There's no elevator to success. Um, don't get outworked. So for everybody who says, how, uh, how should I succeed in life? My answer is, work hard. How's that? Be good to all the people all the time and work hard. My third one is, I had the opportunity to live outside of the United States. I lived in London for a year and a half. Boy, the talent across the rest of the world is amazing. Many of you probably come, have roots or have family that's outside of the United States. Um, don't ever think that all the best ideas or all the best people were born in the USA. It's just not true. And be open to the diversity um, that's around us in the world. Oops, sorry. Um, number four, um, learn from everybody. There's good behavior and bad behavior. There is behavior you want to emulate, and there's behavior you never want to beha behave like. With that said, learn from it. Um, don't be a jerk. If you thought people were a jerk when they treated you that way, just don't do it. But you should, that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn from it. And my fifth one is, um, I'm a big fan of US history, and there was a great general, uh, George Patton, and George Patton used to have a uh, line that he would use, and he would say, look, a, a, uh, a good plan violently executed today is better than a great plan executed next week. Um, that means get on with it. And so w when I deal with my team, I'm always doing this. Let's go, pace, let's make our decisions, let's, let's roll with things. Um, last thing I want to say to you is, um, this is a great leader in my mind. Um, this is Chip Kelly, he's the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. Before you, before you immediately say, I don't care and I hate you for, for speaking, I want you to know, actually, um, he was also the coach of the uh, Oregon Ducks. I didn't know anything about Chip when he was a coach with the Oregon Ducks. This book called The Tao of Chip Kelly, um, also known in some, uh, some places as the Bible. Um, the Tao of Chip Kelly is, um, uh, is a book written largely about him when he was an Oregon Duck, not a Philadelphia Eagle. So if you hate the Eagles, I'm okay with that. I mean, well, you're wrong, but I'm okay with that. Um, but, but I would tell you that, um, that I think you, this still might be worth it. And by the way, this book was designed for us guys. You know why? It's got the longest chapter in the book is three pages, right? <laughs> So girls, we know you could handle more than that, but three pages is the limit for guys like that. Joe, right? You agree, Tim? Right? So um, three pages. This is some of the chapters in the book, and I want you to hear this because I would tell you this is a great, simple example of leadership on the football field that's exactly applicable to leadership in the business world. And here you go. His chapter names. Chapter one, win the day. Chapter two, we focus on the things we can control. Chapter six, science over tradition, exactly the point that I was making for you about science. Um, chapter seven, we're very, very focused on the process. It's not just the end result, it's how we get there. A little bit like Joe said earlier, which is, you know, you want people with integrity. It's not that I just want you to win. I want you to win the right way. Um, chapter 14, we celebrate as a team. Chapter 15, the only uh, proven shortcut to, to success is hard work. 19, of course, is water the bamboo. Um, 27, it's not a sin to get knocked down, it's a sin to stay down. And 30, play from a desire to ex excel, not a, not a fear of failure. Um, you'd say, I have no clue what water the bamboo means. That's why I have this trusty book. I'm going to read you a chapter in the book. And by the way, guys, this is the end of my comments. Here's the chapter, right? Just this. But I think it's a meaningful chapter, and if I were a student, or if I were an educator, or, Joe, to your credit, the entire idea of a symposium like this, I think, gets after this. And, uh, and I'm just going to quickly read the chapter to you. It said, Chip got this idea from Greg Bell, a motivational speaker and business consultant who used to play basketball for the University of Oregon. Bell starts with a great metaphor about hard work. He says, there's a species of bamboo that has an unusual growth pattern called the giant timber bamboo. What else would you expect to hear? A giant tim timber bamboo. And Chip put it this way. If you water this type of bamboo in the first year, nothing happens. If you water it in the second year, nothing happens. If you water it in the third year, nothing happens. 
And if you water it in the fourth year, it grows 90 feet in six weeks, right? Think about your career. Think about your education. You're not going to get immediate gratification, but you're watering the bamboo. And what Joe is doing and what, what everyone is doing, so Marty, what you're doing here is you're watering the bamboo. It, it's providing that water that over a long period of time will help all of you ultimately grow 90 feet in six weeks. And whether it's, whether it's on the playing field or in business or in life, this concept of think long-term, have a long-term plan, make long-term investments is a really important concept. And so I just wanted to leave you with that. Um, for the handful of Philadelphia Eagle fans in the room, I brought a handful of copies of this for you, and I'm happy to give it to you. You can catch up with me at the uh, reception. So, uh, so that's it. Anyway, thank you. Look forward to catching up with you later. We'll move very quickly right on, uh, and thank you, Rob. Fantastic. I, and I love trivia, and that's, that is really, uh, it's, it's good to know, and it's, a, it's so anecdotal for life. Um, we're going to introduce, uh, the reason I did, I, I always find that you can read somebody's bio in, in some, some program, and you never know if what you're going to say is then going to trip over somebody else, and I didn't want to, if I started talking about all the great things that... Uh, Rob did. I certainly knew that if I started talking about Tim, he would already cover it and be re completely redundant, you know. No, but uh, Tim Fazio, I've known, I guess, probably about seven or eight years now. Uh, and we met uh, through a, a mutual friend. And we've actually, Tim, all, in all seriousness, is a fantastic drummer. He's an OK guitarist, and he's a phenomenal singer. As a matter of fact, he can cover Bruce Springsteen like no one you've ever heard. He can also do the band. He does a whole host of other you know, folks uh, that are out there. He's got his own band. As a matter of fact, they just finished second in the Norwalk Music Festival. Second, correct? And um, so we, we, played, uh, we played guitar in, uh, in uh, a bar before. And um, we've had some really good times. And uh, we've traveled a little bit together. Uh, he is a, the reason that, that Tim is here, I wanted to show you uh, some of those firms that were up there before tend to have a, a, a little bit different style. Tim's going to talk about the style of, of Atlas because it does deviate. You have some that only hire people from Ivy League uh, or have an Ivy League pedigree. You're not going to get into that private equity firm unless you come from an Ivy League or, um, yeah, or a specialized uh, school. Uh, Tim and his partner uh, broke the mold on that, and we like that. We like the, the fact that uh, uh, as, as people have heard me say, I was not a, uh, a, a, uh, an academic student here. Uh, it's the reason why I've been attracted to the sports program, because it gave me a, uh, an outlet, and I made um, a number of really good friends here. And I think that sports is so critical, and I want to thank all the athletic teams that are here, every one of the individuals that are here, because we really appreciate it. And that's where you learn teamwork, and that's where you learn really hard work and perseverance, and it's not always easy, but you're out there, you're participating, and you're playing. So I'd like to introduce Tim Fazio, and then after that, we're going to have, uh, again, Tim's going to talk for a, about a uh, half hour or so, and then we're going to have a question and answer period, and then we also have a um, uh, cocktail reception afterwards. Also, just very quickly, I'd like to thank a couple of other firms that are in the audience here today. We have the Hanover with us. We have Aetna. Uh, with us, and we have uh, Hartford at least, and I apologize if there's anybody else that, that we missed, but we really appreciate it, and, and uh, Rob would say the same thing. Thanks, Tim. Tim Fazio. Pulp and paper industry, steel industry, power generation, rock and roll, Manufacturing in the United States of America, bankruptcy, restructuring, fixing companies, sex. Ladies and gentlemen, these are my passions. <laughs> For the past 15 years, uh, my partners and I at Atlas Holdings have been investing in industries that people think are literally dying. Paper industries like the paper industry, manufacturing in the US. Nobody really talks about, although it's become a little more in vogue, but nobody really talks about investing in those sectors. And not only do we invest in those troubled sectors, we buy businesses that are, are deeply, deeply distressed. 
Some of them are about to be liquidated. Uh, some of them are in bankruptcy. Some of them have actually been shut down and closed. And our job, what we're going in, is we're rescuing these businesses. We're injecting capital. We're injecting expertise. We're injecting enthusiasm and great management. And we're taking these businesses that were once left for dead, and we're transforming them into long-term, sustainable, viable enterprises. And along the way, over the last 15 years, we've made a few bucks. We paid a couple bills. Um, but the thing that I'm certainly the most proud of is when I think about every day, 12,000 people wake up in the morning and they go through factory gates at our factories. And these were people who otherwise would be unemployed if we didn't intervene. And they go to work every day, they're able to provide for their families, they've got health insurance, and they're able to put their kids through schools. And that, for me, is what business is all about. Creating real, tangible value that you can see. So for the next 30 minutes, I want to talk you through a few things. I'm going to talk to you about the Atlas story, how we got started, uh, where we started, where we are. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got to this place, which I really don't like to take myself very seriously, so I'm, it's hard for me to even say that. Um, and then the last piece, I want to, I, like Rob, I want to leave you with a couple of life lessons that I've learned along the way that I've pretty much learned the hard way. So. Before I get started, we are an SEC filing uh, fund. So I cannot take investment dollars from you today. And I'm not soliciting your money. And what this disclaimer basically says is anything that I tell you today uh, may or may not be true. Uh, it can't be relied upon at all uh, per the SEC. And so you have to take everything with a grain of salt. So in terms of Atlas, as, as Joe suggested, we are a private equity fund. We are gathering money from a bunch of individuals, uh, institutions like a company like AIG, insurance companies, uh, endowments from universities, pension funds, high net worth individuals like Joe. Um, and we're compiling this money together and putting our, a lot of our own money to work. And we're buying private businesses. We say in the middle market, that means less than $500 million companies. They're still pretty big businesses. But for us, the focus is we like businesses that make stuff. We like distributing stuff that we understand. Things like toilet paper, we love the toilet paper business. Plywood, we love plywood. Steel tubing, paper, you name it. Those things that are tangible that you can understand, that you can see. And the, the thing that's challenging about the business is that you constantly need to figure out a way to buy stuff for less than it's worth. I mean, that, that is the core of investing, right? It's actually buying an asset that everybody else in the world believes is worth less than you do, and you're actually right. And when you buy the asset, it's actually worth a lot more. So the way we accomplish that, our strategy, and there's lots of different strategies on this, uh, but the way we do it is we focus on companies with problems. Um, there are all kinds of problems. They're bankrupt, they've got litigation issues, they've got you know, unions that don't like them, they're orphan stepchildren within a big company that nobody's paid attention to for years. And our skill set, what we're good at, is in these particular industries where we've developed true operating expertise, we're able to identify the problems, fix the problems, get them out of bankruptcy, get the businesses restructured, and stabilize them. The difference, though, for us, is at the end, you know, and I know private equity sort of has a bad name. You buy companies, you break them up, and you sell them. That's the antithesis of our world. Uh, we think that the best investments are made with management teams and in companies that you already own. And so we build them for the long term. And when you build them for the long per term, your returns compound and compound over many, many years. Um, this is uh, actually kind of interesting because uh, I, I didn't know Rob was going to be such a football fan. And uh, a, big, a good analogy for our business is the Oakland Raiders in the 1970s, which is probably way before your time. It's borderline for me. But I will mention that the Raiders did beat the Eagles in 1980. And I didn't mean to bring this up at this event here. But, but you'll see that the Ra our, our, our investment strategy is very much what the Raiders executed in, in this time period. Oops. So somehow I have to get it to play. Maybe <laughs> there's a little. Oh, there you go. 
In their own way, the Raiders embodied an American ideal. They created a superpower by providing safe harbor for the wretched refuse of the NFL. I don't think most of these guys are outcasts. I just think they weren't understood. <laughs> these guys were nothing but great athletes, but just need a little bit of love and needed to play football the way it was supposed to be played. Just go out there and play. Go out there and hit some people. Get rid of the rules, and uh, and you could be a, you could be a great player with the Raiders. And I think that's that's why we were so good. Rocket giving to Allen, sending the wide left. He has to reverse his field, and he gets away for a moment. For more than 30 years, the Raiders have lived by their own rules. They don't copy other teams. They don't even repeat themselves. What they do is win. Their tradition and their mystique are unlike any other in the history of the game. Oakland trails, 10 seconds left. Stay right Can he throw? He can! So the point is, we're, we're not rocket scientists. We're doing uh, a strategy that lots and lots of people have done, which is we're taking on the outcasts, the unloved, the crazy people, but their businesses in our case. Um, we're letting them kind of do their own thing within our certain guidelines of how we think we can create excellence and in a very, very entrepreneurial fashion, and then we're focused on results. For us, it's about keeping safe work environments and driving returns for us and our investors. For the Raiders, it's about winning the Super Bowl. Sorry about that, Rob. Um, so, so this was Atlas uh, in 1999. Uh, this was back, it feels like the Stone Age is 15 years ago. Um, so in 1990, I'll, I'll tell you how we got started. So in 1996, uh, I graduated from college, and I went to work for a guy named Bill Berkeley. And Bill actually is an insurance uh, guy. He owns a company called WR Berkeley Corporation. And he, had a, he also on, had a side business, because he was a billionaire, you know, you got to have a business off to the side, uh, called Interlaken Capital. And what Interlaken did is it bought private businesses, very similar to what we're doing now. When I got there, I met my partner, Andy Bursky, and Bill was an absolutely brilliant guy about investing, and he really changed my mindset about how things work. And he was very contrarian. He always said, go into markets that everybody else absolutely despises. They hate them. And find the smartest people, people who have operated in that industry for their entire lives, and go start looking for assets. And what I mean by despise, I mean capital leaves the market, nobody wants to invest and buy companies, Banks don't want to lend to companies. Uh, talented people don't want to work in those businesses. So everything is running away from those businesses. And so that was kind of our strategy. So in 1997, my partner and I started looking at the paper industry. And the reason for that is in 97, the world sort of woke up and said, gee, there are these things called computers and email uh, and texting. Well, I guess there wasn't texting, but there was email. And there became a recognition that paper demand over time was going to begin to decline. And so prices for paper absolutely plummeted. People just were forecasting major overcapacity in the markets. And capital fled from the industry. So Wall Street, stock prices plummeted. Wall Street hated paper companies. So we said, gee, this is a perfect place for us to look. And so we met two operating guys who had spent their lives in the industry and were very successful. And we started hunting around for assets. And we found a little mill up in uh, Hartford City, Indiana, which is about an hour and a half uh, northwest of Indianapolis. And um, it fit our profile perfectly. The seller, uh, who was also a paper company, they were building a new plant in Staten Island. And they had run out of money. And because everybody hated the paper industry, all the banks, nobody would lend them money. And so they were going broke building this new project but they had this asset in the Midwest that they needed to sell, and nobody else showed up to buy it because nobody else in the industry had money. And nobody was getting rewarded, big companies were not getting rewarded for buying more assets. 
So it was our time to strike. So we worked on this thing for a year. We finally sign up a deal. We arrange all the financing. We sign contracts. Um, we're literally sitting at the closing table in the summer of 1998. And at this point, you used to close transactions actually in person. So we were sitting at a table. There's the other sellers got a gazillion lawyers. We got a gazillion lawyers. Contracts are signed. We call up Bill Berkeley. We say, okay, we're ready. Time to fund the deal. And he says, after he didn't return our phone call a couple of times, he said, I don't like the deal. I don't like the markets. And so I'm not funding the deal. So the whole thing blew up. And uh, we got sued, and there was a big mess. And so we spent the next two months of our lives cleaning up this big mess that we created for ourselves by not buying the business. And after the smoke cleared, my partner and I look at each other, and we're like, we need to buy this business ourselves. The only problem was we didn't have any money. So, um, so on nights and weekends, we ran around to, to all sorts of financing sources. And uh, by the grace of God, John Hancock Life Insurance Company said, I really like this project. And so the two of us scraped together friends and family money. My partner had some money. And uh, we bought our first business. And so this, is, this was us in 99. Um, and it was two of us and an assistant. And we had 90 people working for us and $35 million in revenue. So fast forward 15 years. Um, we have bought 40 companies, 40 plus. We have 110 locations around the world. Uh, we're 100 times the size that we were 15 years ago. Three and a half billion in revenue, um, 12,000 employees. Uh, we're all over the world. And uh, as Rob said, it has not been, uh, we are not rocket scientists, we're not geniuses. We just stick to our focused approach for how we do business, and we work very, very hard at it. Um, this is sort of our uh, companies. I won't go through them, but those are the sectors that we invest in. Um, I have a movie here, too. Alex? Oh, could you just hit the play, please? Thank you. So these are our companies. This will give you a little flavor of what we do. In 1932, a Sicilian immigrant named Nicholas Marcalis started a paper company. Not just any paper company, but one that recycled old paper to make new paper. This was a revolutionary idea. Today, Marcal is part of the Soundview Paper Company, a new organization led by industry veterans who, like Nicholas Marcalis, have a lofty goal, to be the world standard in paper products for home and commercial use. Every steel mill in the world, from North and South America to Europe, Asia, and Africa, is fighting to keep its competitive edge and improve profitability. In this highly competitive global market, tacking inefficiency and waste is critical to survival. That's why mills all over the world are turning to Phoenix Services. Throughout history, bridges have influenced cultures and improved the way we travel, conduct business, and link communities. We drive over them every day. But have you ever wondered what it takes to build one? Veritas Steel LLC, a new member of the Atlas family, can tell you. Headquartered in Chicago, Veritas Steel is a leader in the steel bridge fabrication industry and has a broad range of experience in the manufacture of highly complex steel structures. In the wood products industry, change is a given, particularly with the events that occurred in the last decade. Not long after Atlas Holdings was formed in 2002, one of its first platform businesses was Wood Resources LLC, created with its acquisition of Olympic Panel Products in 2003 and subsequently expanding with the purchase from Weyerhaeuser of the Chester and Moncure plywood mills in the southeast shortly thereafter. So that's kind of what we do. Um, those are the kinds of companies we buy. Um, this, is our, this, is a, this is our team. So we have our team uh, in Greenwich that are people who analyze and assess investments. But a core part of our uh, strategy has been this partnership with these deeply experienced 
industry veterans that we bring into our investing process. This is a list of 50 of these people who, who work with us. A um, couple, uh, couple of success stories just to give you some color on, on how we do what we do. Um, so in 2002, uh, we started to look at the steel industry. The steel market was incredibly depressed, as I was describing the paper market. And there were 35 bankruptcies across the United States uh, in the steel market. So we started looking around for assets, and we met a guy named Russ Meyer, who had been in the industry for 45 years, grizzled industry veteran. We started looking through all these different companies that were bankrupt. We found this one gem of an asset in South Lyon, Michigan. It was a mill that had been shut down. It made a very, very uh, unique product that only one other plant in all of North America could make. And the reason it got shut down is it was part of a much, much larger bankruptcy process, and the bank took over the business. So we looked at this thing. Again, we spent the better part of a year designing a new work paradigm for the business that was much more efficient, solving some environmental problems. And we, invest, we bought the business for three million bucks in 2002. We invest another $7 million in the business. Uh, we ramp up production. It's very, very difficult for a number of years. Finally, we start to beat up the competition. We bring the business back. 2008, the business does $100 million in sales, $20 million of profit, and we get approached by a Ukrainian guy who makes us a proverbial offer we can't refuse, and we sell the business. So this is the type of thing that we're trying to do. And you, know, you can invest. I wish I could in Google and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. But even investing in these sort of basic industrial markets, on a deal like that, you can generate 10 times your money. So you can turn $10 million into $100 million. Um, the second one's even more unique. In some of these industries, things are so bad that people will actually pay you to take assets. And so the case of Northern Pulp, uh, a big public company decided we have to get out of the pulp business. And nobody wanted to touch this asset because they had the most horrific labor contract that I had ever seen in my career. It was sort of a 1940s-style labor contract. It was, it, what it said was, you know, Bill has to hold a hammer. Uh, you know, Kim, she needs to, you know, she, she can hold the nail. And Joe, he can hold the piece of plywood. And so you'd need all three of those people to go do the tiniest little project. It was incredibly inefficient. And it made the mill uncompetitive. But people were scared of the unions. They said, gee, you can't go take on a labor union in, in Canada, in eastern Canada. They're going to strike you. They're going to, in fact, they're going to pop your tires. They're going to try to kill you. And, uh, and so we said, all right, well, we'll take this thing on. And so they paid us $15 million to take an asset that did, I think, $300 million in sales. And instead of going at the union sort of in their face, like, guys, you must do this, we said, here are the facts. And we met with every single employee individually. We said, here are the facts. Here's the financial performance. Here's what your competitors are doing. If we don't get this cost structure right, this thing's going to be gone. And it is amazing to me in how many companies that I see where the cultures are so broken, there's such a lack of trust between management and the people who do the work every day, that they can't get something like this done. So it took a couple of knuckleheads, really, down from Greenwich, Connecticut, to go up to Nova Scotia and say, this is what we need to do. And guess what? We were able to structure early retirement packages for 100 out of 300 employees. They were all elated. They could go hunting quicker. They could go to their pension early or whatever. But the point is that took massive amounts of cost out of that business and made it a very competitive pulp mill. And so two years later, a couple of Chinese guys show up at our door and say, we, got, we need pulp because we got a lot of people that need tissue over in China. Uh, and uh, we want to buy your pulp mill. So they paid us $100 million for that business. But that's the kind of stuff that you can do um, with troubled businesses in tough markets where you use a little bit of brain power and a lot of hard work. So my journey uh, started in uh, northern New Jersey. I was, I was born uh, in North Jersey. I am the uh, youngest of four kids. I have three uh, older sisters. It's probably why I'm not married yet. Um, they, they tortured me. But, uh, but I do love them. I still love them. So I, I grew up, my parents are fantastic. It's, a, uh, it's an Irish-Italian combo, hence the Tim uh, Fazio. So we like to drink and eat. We pretty much cover like every possible vice you can imagine in my family. Um, 
so holidays are fantastic. Um, so anyway, but I grew up in a family that was uh, very, my parents were very concerned about education because they saw their parents struggle. They never went to college. Uh, my parents didn't have opportunities to go to grade school, so they were always very focused on, on uh, where we would go uh, with our education. And it was funny, two days ago, a buddy of mine sent me this picture. Um, so this is where my education began. Um, I'm that little guy right there. Uh, that's my buddy Todd, he sent me the picture. Um, and when I saw this picture, it was kind of random, but I, I really did see a life lesson in here for, for everybody, which is, um, as you can see here, I must have been telling some kind of joke, um, because this was my girlfriend, Dana. We, we, uh, we really had a thing for each other. So I knew that she liked me. She used to give me boats, and I would take them in the tub and stuff. But, um, but the, uh, the, what I didn't know here is that Jen Ward here, she, she kind of liked me. She was into that, too. And, uh, and Fiona Berryack, she was liking that as well. So the moral of this story, the moral of this story here is that because I have never had three women like interested in me at the same time simultaneously in my life. So the moral of this story is even if you peak at four years old, you can still, you can still actually go on and have like a relatively normal life. So anyway, so back to my story. So, so I, I, I had, you know, as you can see, I was a pretty happy kid. I had a great childhood and um, did reasonably well in school, played in a rock band, all kinds of stuff. And so, but it was all kind of culminating to, you know, where was, was I going to, you know, where was I thinking about going to college? Although, hold on one sec, because I forgot one thing. But, so, there was one major formative thing that happened uh, in my childhood that I think sent me down this path. And it's, it's something that, as, you know, you guys are thinking about your careers and your life, um, from a very early age in my life, I always had an intention out there, sort of a goal, that someday I would be in my own business. I just kind of knew that. And the way that happened is when I was seven years old, uh, my dad came home from work one day, and uh, he, had a, he, was, he was like the head sales guy of a big company uh, in the Northeast. And so he had like a you know, powder blue El Dorado, and life was good in New Jersey. So he comes home from work one day, and he says, the company said they want to transfer me out to Detroit, Michigan to get a vice president job. And so my mother, my mother's like, oh my goodness, a vice president, yes. And my father's like, my father's like, there's absolutely no effing way. I'm going to Detroit, Michigan. I'm a guy from New Jersey. My kids are growing up here, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, well, then what are you going to do? <laughs> and so my father, she kind of does something, but it, it, I love her dearly. But anyway, so my father, he says, I'm going to start my own business. And so my father went out at the age of 40, and he started a restaurant business uh, in, in South New Jersey. And it was an absolute disaster. So he, he lost all his money. He lost the powder blue Cadillac. He had to go out and buy a Subaru wagon. And, uh, you know, things were kind of tough at that point. And so instead of sort of bringing in his horns and going back to, to work in, in corporate America, uh, he said, you know what, I'm going to start another business. Um, and he started a payroll business in northern New Jersey. And this became sort of the, what my family became about. You know, it was so important because he was staring down the barrel of having uh, four kids within, you know, five to ten years going through college. And my mother was not going to live in a world where they weren't going to great schools that were expensive. And so this poor guy starts up a business in North Jersey, a payroll business, and we just, there was something about that process that I loved. You know, it was like every day he would come home from work, we'd sit at the dinner table, and I'd be like, how many accounts did you sell today? He'd be like, I got two. And they'd be like, I got to go back to the office because I got to actually process the payrolls and then deliver them. And my mother went to work for him, and she's worked with him for 35 years, and they're still at it. And it just became this thing where I said, you know what, I just love what he did and that he became so independent, he had the, the you know, to go out and do that. Um, and so, but I remember when I was about 16, I was talking about what I wanted to do, and he said to me, if you're gonna start a business, please do it when you're younger before you have kids. And so I, that was always in the back of my mind, it was always an intention. So fast forward, I applied to all these colleges. 
My mother, again, had this dream. All my sisters went to great schools, you know, Georgetown, whatever. But she always had this dream that one of her children would go to the Ivy League. And so we didn't have any connections, so we sort of looked at the law of numbers, and I applied to every single Ivy League school known to mankind. And I really wanted to go to Brown because I wanted to go pass fail and smoke pot for four years. Um, So, plus John F. Kennedy Jr. got through there, so I figured, you know, anybody could do it. So, but on December 31st of that year, my mom was like, you should apply to the University of Pennsylvania. And I was like, why do I want to go to a football school in the middle of Pennsylvania? And she's like, no, the one in the Ivy League. It's the worst one. You might be able to get in. (laughs) So... Anyway, so it's literally, the, the application is due the next day. So I'm banging this thing out on my typewriter. I can't believe we had a typewriter. My buddy Todd, again, bad influencing me. Oh, you know, he's still trying to get over the fact that his mother dressed him in a skirt back there. But anyway, <laughs> so he's bad influencing me. And so, and I don't want to say this because I know this is being videotaped and there's going to be a big scandal at Penn. They're going to take away my diplomas and all that stuff. But my mother put the finishing touches on my application. Let's put it that way. And so August 14th comes... We get a basket of mail, and I'm flipping through, uh, you know, Brown waitlisted, Cornell rejected, Georgetown rejected, Princeton rejected. Every single school I applied to rejected me, and or waitlisted. And we were, I was devastated. My parents were devastated. My grandparents who had worked all these, you know, we were all devastated. And it's just amazing the gifts that life gives you when you don't even know that they're coming. And so the next day I come home from school, it's, it's April 15th. As we know, the Penn people are always a little slower than the rest of the guys. I get a letter from Penn, and it says, you're in. So this is a school that I had never seen before in my life. I had never read a page on them. I knew nothing except that Michael Darcy, a kid who used to collect comic books up the street, went there. And so my dad and I, the next day, said, you know what, let's go down to Penn. And it was like, a perfect spring day, I'm in the middle of campus, there's girls in bikinis, there's guys doing keg stands, and I literally went into the Shawshank Redemption pose, <laughs> and I, I was like, I just knew, I knew it was the right thing for me. You know, it wasn't a decision that I needed to make, it just, I knew it. And I, I think when you get to decision points in life, it's so important to just know And that happened to me again. So four years later, uh, and then I'm going to get to the end of this boring story, but anyway, four years later, I, um, Penn was great. It was like a meat market for jobs. So you would like, you know, I had all the, in 1995, 96, it was the Clinton years, you know, we were, everything was going crazy. And so, um, so I had job offers from Merrill Lynch and Credit Suisse and Bain and Company, all these great places. And like at the end of the recruiting period, I get this kind of crappy letter in my mailbox that I open up, and it's a one-page letter. It's it's from Bill Berkeley. It says, you know, dear Tim, I run a $2 billion holding company. We buy and operate companies. I just remember reading that. I'm too cheap to hire MBAs. We hire one person every year. Goodbye. And so, (laughs) and I literally held this piece of paper. I was standing next to my girlfriend at the time, and I said, this is the job for me, and I knew it. And I was two hours late for the interview. Um, They paid me half of what I was going to get paid at these other places. Everyone I knew thought I was nuts. And I said, this is it. And all along, I had that intention in my mind that I want to be in my own business. Bill Berkeley's in his own business. Somehow, that's going to take me to my own business. And I didn't even think twice about those kinds of decisions. So a couple of lessons learned. Um, The first one's about investing. You know, Webster's Dictionary says this. It's the outlay of money, usually for income or profit, capital outlay. It's sort of this concept like, oh, you put, it was like this business school concept that I remember. I'm sure at the University of Hartford, you guys teach people how to actually make money. At Wharton, they taught us it's impossible to make money because markets are so efficient that everybody has the same information, and so you can't actually make money. And this is that kind of definition, sort of like we put money out and we may make some money, and that's what an investment is. So I want to ask you, if anyone, and I have, I have a prize here, actually, if someone will answer my question. Uh, it's quite large, but um, so in this black bag is a prize. Um, so if anyone will volunteer to tell me 
Uh, what they think is the key to making systematic investments that result in great returns time and time again. Anyone? There's a big prize here, even for a guess. I mean, a, you, I can't, you're not good. Anyone? Luck? Okay, you win the prize. Here, uh, it's, the timing is very good because we're right around Halloween here. And uh, let me just dig in here. It's, uh, it's very important. It's, uh, it's, it's Marcal, it's your own. It's your own thing of Marcal tissue. So you can paper the whole neighborhood tomorrow night with this thing. It's going to be awesome. So please do. And uh, so I think, I think luck actually, luck is a, luck is a good answer um, because it's, this stuff is very hard. And it's an art. And it's something that, um, you know, we are constantly working on, thinking about. So one thing that I am sure about is that the you want to see value where others see shit. Um, and I know that sounds, sorry about that. But, um, uh, and so my analogy for this is uh, a guy goes, this is actually a true story, you can Google it. Guy goes into a garage sale. He sees, a, he sees a print on the ground of a Picasso. And he's looking at it and it's for five bucks. And so he dusts the thing off, he buys it for five bucks and he goes home, so he takes it out of the frame. And he says, okay, you know, maybe I'll reframe this and make it nice. And as he's taking it out of the frame, he realized that there's, a, there's like a title on the back of this painting. And so he's like, whoa, this may actually be a real Picasso. And it actually was. And so that is the essence to me of, and that's an extreme example, but that's the essence to me of great investing. It's about having some special insight, uh, some amount of expertise. And in our case, what we're doing is we're finding companies that are covered in dust and grime and stuff, uh, and we're removing that stuff to find that sort of diamond in the rough. Buffett had an interesting way to say it, which is again, you know, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. What that's all about is running away from the herd. In investing, in my view, if you stay with the herd, sometimes it feels pretty good. But at the end of the day, you're going to get trampled. And it's really, really hard to have a very independent point of view consistently. It's very hard. It takes a lot of work because you've got to actually really study what you're looking at to have conviction that the rest of the world thinks oil is going up, but I believe it's going down. That's when you make money. But you have to do the work to see that. And it takes courage. And I mean, that's my, my favorite Robert Frost quote is so apropos to investing. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled, and it has made all of the difference. I absolutely believe that. And then this is, you know, my famous quote that you'll see out there. Uh, so read it, and then many years later, you can quote me at some kind of. Um, so my last vignette, and then I'm done. Um, so I came from a world of crunching numbers and finance, um, and over the years, I've learned that what makes the great successful business different from the business that we're acquiring that fails is the quality of the team uh, that you put on the field every day and whether or not you can get that team driving in the same direction day after day, uh, you know, in unison, with, with, with passion, uh, with empowerment, et cetera. And so the way I learned this lesson uh, was the hard way. Um, which is in, in 2004, uh, we bought a plywood mill uh, in Chester, South Carolina. This is about an hour south of, of Charlotte uh, from a company called Warehouser Company. It was an ignored asset, hadn't been invested in or maintained. And um, so we bought, we bought this mill. Um, but when we were going through the process of trying to finance this mill, because at the time we didn't really have any money, we called up people at Goldman Sachs. Why, why we approached Goldman Sachs, I have no idea. They were way bigger, we were tiny, but anyway. So we call Goldman Sachs, we say, hey listen, we need you to lend us $35 million to buy this business. And they say, and we, we lay out our whole plan, and they say, you know what, we're gonna hire the former CEO of Warehouser. His name's Dwayne McDougall. He knows this mill, he bought it originally, he knows it like the back of his hand. He's gonna do the due diligence to see if we should invest. 
So we bring Dwayne down to the mill. We have this great day. We say, look, we're going to install some new equipment here, and that's going to drive productivity. Um, we think the mill's undermanaged, and so once we start managing it better, we're going to get even more productivity. It's located lo close to the northeast, so it's in a great logistics location, and we're going to create one of the lowest cost mills in the entire country from this asset. And so he went around and shook hands and whatever and went back. So the next day we call Goldman and we say, uh, okay, you know, like, are you, you guys ready to go on this deal? And they said, no. They said, Dwayne thinks this is the craziest thing he's ever heard. So we call him. We say, Dwayne, we laid out our whole plan. We told you what we're going to do. You agreed with everything we said. And he said, I know, Tim. He said, the problem with this Chester mill is it's haunted. And I said, what do you mean it's haunted? A haunted mill? He said, you will never get those people to work for you. Those people are evil. They don't care. Uh, they're not responsible, blah, 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 blah. And so Goldman passed on the deal. Fortunately, there were some knuckleheads in Stanford that we had been talking to as well, and they said, all right, guys, we'll finance this deal. So we bought the business. And Dwayne McDougal was absolutely right. For the first three years, this mill was absolutely haunted. Embarrassingly, we put... $20 million of additional capital into this mill, put in all sorts of new equipment, uh, started to execute our strategy, and we were making less product than these guys at Warehouser. We just couldn't get the place to run, and it was a cultural thing. We just couldn't motivate the people. Uh, you know, as Joe was talking about in his Gallup poll, I think people were working against us, and so we canvassed. The only thing, we were sort of down to our last legs, so we canvassed the country, and we find a guy named Dick Baldwin, who was a 70-year-old plywood man. He had been in the industry for 45 years. He actually has written uh, the, the, the major textbook on plywood manufacturing that's used by you know, NC State for these purposes. And we brought him into the, the mill to run it. And so after a few days of him being down there, we get together with Dick and we say, you know, what's your diagnosis? It must be that some of these assets aren't working that we can't get the lathe to run properly, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, no. He said, what you guys have wrong here, what you've been doing wrong all along, is you have no idea how to empower and engage these people. So here's what I'm going to do if you want me to be the CEO of this business. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this the safest work environment in the entire country. And if people know that they're coming to work every day and they're going to be safe, they're going to work much harder for you. And that's what he did. Just He just simply focused on safety. No dollars, no nothing. And that's what happened. People started wanting to come to work. Their families appreciated that we were focused on their safety. The second thing he said is, I'm going to start to measure everything in this mill and I'm going to tell people about it. It's amazing to me how many times we buy businesses where nobody has any idea what a good day is or what a bad day is. And uh, so Dick put in KPIs so everybody knew what a good day is and a bad day is. And then when people started to achieve those good days more than bad days, we started to pay them. And the results were astounding, which is we didn't put in any more money. And our production was up 25%. And our costs dropped through the floor. And the business became wildly profitable. So in 2012, in the summer, a company calls us out of the blue called Boise Cascade. They say, we want to buy your business. We say, what's the price? They say 110 million. We say done. And so Boise Cascades buys, buys this business that we paid $35 million for. And guess who the chairman of Boise Cascade was? Dwayne McDougal, the guy who said the place was haunted. <laughs> so anyway, you go figure. Um, so anyway, in conclusion, um, uh, my last thing I'll tell you is that uh, I do believe that life is short. Um, these 18 years have gone back, gone by in a flash. Um, so you got to find something that you really love to do. And to me, uh, the currency in life is not the almighty dollar. The currency in life is finding fulfillment and happiness in everything you do. So I just encourage you guys to go out and do that, find it, engage it, harness it, uh, and take it with you. So thank you very much. Joe, thank you. Rob, thank you. Uh, and thank you all. Okay, so um, in looking at the time, thank you, Tim Fazio, Rob Schimmick again from AIG. Just another round of quick applause.
every year we try to run this as tight as we can, but I think you can see as, these, as people start talking, it gets kind of infectious and you want to impart so much information and the stories are so interesting. Uh, we really appreciate the time that, that everybody spends on this. So we're gonna just spend right now, first of all, Tim and Rob will be out in the audience or out in the cocktail party for the next hour. So certainly encourage you to ask him any questions. I know that Marty just has a couple of little closing comments that he wants to make, but Kim and Carolyn, do you wanna just, can we just ask maybe for two questions uh, that if anybody has any questions in the audience right now that they'd like to direct towards Tim and or um, Rob, or otherwise I would certainly invite you guys to come uh, into the... Uh, And that's, that's fine. Uh, we got one? Okay, right here. Just... Um. My question is, um, just on uh, how you guys help the fraud in the enlightenment with uh, abusing the privacy of websites. Okay, I think we'll have to go back. Is, is Tim's uh, mic on? Uh, oh, or, or fraud. You mean fraud. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we spend a... a sometime uh, worried about fraud, but I think that's what your due diligence is, right? So when we, when we target a uh, business to acquire, we send in you know, legions of accountants and so forth. But the other way you manage it um, is the way you structure your contracts with the seller, uh, in many cases, provides you with some kind of warranties, basically saying that if the numbers that we presented you, for example, are wrong, um, then you, know, you can collect money from them. So there's, there's a variety of ways to manage it, but ultimately it's all about your diligence. You know, you gotta be incredibly diligent and you, know, you can usually figure these things out. We've never had a fraud and we've done 40 of these things. And I also think that in general people are good until I'm proven wrong. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Yeah. yeah so, so, so I'll say from an insurance perspective, um, we invest a lot of money in detecting fraud, and we do um, from the perspective of trying to, um, to save our clients money. So, you know, we're charging premiums for everything we have to pay out the door, but sometimes what we have to pay out the door is because of fraud. And so the more we can do a really effective job of detecting that before we pay those funds out the door, the more that we can actually pass the savings right back to our clients in the first place. And a really interesting anecdote is that um, culturally, many people in our company believed that if you were gonna find, find fraud, you'd find it in maybe in the United States, maybe you'd find it in Latin America, but you would not find fraud, for example, in a country with a really strong culture like Japan. And interestingly, we are the fourth largest insurance company in Japan. We've used some of the same technology that we use in the United States now in Japan. And what did we find? That the results are exactly the same. Meaning, it's everywhere. Um, and you ha we have a responsibility as an insurance provider to be really, really, really in sophist sophisticated in how we detect it. You wouldn't believe the types of fraud that we encounter on a on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a really interesting, by the way, career option for people who think about forensic uh, work. Um, that kind of uh, career potential, I think, is increasing and getting a greater profile all the time. Fantastic. Marty, do you wanna wrap up and then will you invite any other questions uh, outside? Thank you. Well, once again, uh, I really want to echo Joe's uh, remarks and uh, thank both uh, Tim and Rob for joining us this evening. It's uh, great to have you at the University of Hartford and the Barney School of Business. We really appreciate your time and sharing kind of really both ends of the spectrum from the, uh, the kind of the user's perspective of the, um, the, the small business, the startup that's looking to uh, buy business and kind of understand the, uh, the profile of risk that they need to manage to the largest insurer in the world, you know, AIG, which can be the, uh, the service provider and certainly what Joe shared with us where companies like him try to be at the intersection of uh, both, of those, both of those needs. So thank you both very much for being here.
and once again, I'd really like to thank Joe uh, for being the pioneer behind this uh, symposium concept. Um, every year he uh, kind of reimagines it, what can be, what can take the symposium to the next level, what are the kind of new uh, guests that he can bring to, uh, to the university and to the Hartford community uh, for not only our students but for our alumni and our friends um, working, working here in the Hartford area uh, to gain some new, new perspectives on the intersection of risk and finance. So Joe, thank you once again. So we invite everybody to uh, join us outside. We have a uh, reception available. Uh, we, uh, all of our guests will be here, Joe, Rob, Tim, and uh, their respective teams will be available for you to meet and talk with and learn a little bit more uh, about uh, their backgrounds, their interests, and how we can leverage their knowledge for our career growth. Thank you all very much for being here.